Um, we know a lot about the phylogeny of uh, land plants. We know in terms of uh, which algal groups the land plants are derived from. And here's a, a 2012 uh, uh, phylogeny uh, looking at the, uh, the, the caraphytes. In other words, this is this group of, of, of green algae, the, the caraphyte algae, uh, are the progenitors of the, the, of the land plants. But there's a huge gap in morphology and reality between the zygnematales, which are filament, largely filamentous uh, form, and the complex morphology, the complex multicellular morphology that's associated with land plants. So we're a long way from understanding the evolution of that complex multicellularity. Um, the, the current theory for how the origin of the, the plant body itself, the sporophyte, occurred goes back to uh, the work of this man, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, a Bauer in 1908, and his idea was that the, the pl plant gametophyte, the gametophyte phase of the life cycle was essentially uh, aquatic or semi-aquatic, amphibious, and that the sporophytes evolved in response to subaerial conditions, living in subaerial conditions, and that the sporophyte was intercalated, that was a, the plant, the phase intercalated into the gametophytic life cycle. The second was that plants spores evolved before the sporophyte itself. And so that presents a, a, at least a model or a hypothesis for how the, the origin of land plants, how that process occurred. And here's a, a little, just a diagram kind of putting that out in, um, in a diagrammatic way. Then we start out with some kind of an algal zygote with, that produces naked zoospores, say the a way that happens in Coyote <coughs> Uh, we have sub selection that causes the zoospores to insist and form spores. Uh, mitotic divisions interpolate a diploid thallus so that we have a, an intercalation of this, this new organism uh, that is, evolves after the spores themselves evolve. And then the last part is this, the, the, uh, the part that we really have no idea uh, how that happened, which is how do we take that evolved thallus and incorporate it into the genome of the evolving lineage in such a way that it becomes incorporated into it, an embryo. So we have no idea how that occurred. Now the rest of this talk, um, I really want to, uh, I'm going to focus on the fossil record and I'm going to focus in particular on spores and cryptospores. Uh, just as kind of an example of what, how these organ, or how they relate to this theory. Can we, can we see what the fossil record has to say about this process, this process of going from a simple algal morphology to a complex plant. And there are two lines of evidence that seem to support Bauer's idea. Uh, the first is the, that uh, studies of extant bryophyte sporogenesis uh, have something to say about uh, the uh, heterochronic uh, transfer of sporopollen into the uh, dep sporopollen deposition on the spore, and it looks, that looks like in an evolutionary sense, the spores came before uh, the sporophytic development did. And then I'll be looking at the stratigraphic record of fossil cryptospores. And then I'll show a couple of, uh, at the end, a couple of examples of these interesting kind of spore-like phthalae that were uh, reported on uh, uh, in a paper that was published this year. So here's the Brown and Lemons diagram, diagram which you start out with uh, in, in the algal phase of sporogenesis uh, deposition, uh, spore pollen and deposition occurs early on. It is then retarded so that the deposition is coming on the spore walls of the, the wall of the developing sporophyte or the developing, or the actual myospores. And that cytokinesis then is presaged or it's sort of, it's previewed in uh, bryophyte sporogenesis by these uh, transverse, these prophase bands and other features like quadrilobing, et cetera, et cetera. So that there, it's obvious that in bryophyte evolution, the, there's been a heterochronous development and also a decoupling of karyokinesis and cytokinesis uh, in the actual evolution of modern sporogenesis. Now here's the core of the rest of the talk, is to look at that stratigraphic record, and I've just made a cartoon diagram uh, roughly to scale to show that there's a disjunct distribution that is, that is cut in, during the Darwinian of uh, cryptospores, these are tetras and dyads and polyads uh, that occur in Cambro-Ordovician rocks uh, versus these middle Ordovician and upward 
uh, spores. And then finally, at the top, we have the, the real thing, which is the, land, the, the true land plants that occur that, uh, in the upper part of the Silurian. It just, just shows some of the localities where these are found. Now, just as an aside, um, to try to prove that what I'm going to talk about in the Cambrian is really related to uh, land plants, we see similar ultrastructure in these Cambrian spores in terms of both in terms of the walls. So here we have some Cambrian examples that match Ordovician forms. And then also we see similar morphology, ultrastructural morphology in the, spore, spore, the laminar spore walls with modern crown group uh, liverworts as well. So here's some of the sites where we found, uh, uh, where some of these Cambrian uh, outcrops where we found Cambrian material. Uh, but I'm going to focus on two sections today in terms of where this uh, material comes from. This is the Conasaga group in eastern Tennessee. We have material from Nola Truckee Shale, Rogersville, Pumpkin Valley Shale, and also the upper, this uh, lower Cambrian Rome formation. And then some of this is, a, I'll show you a few things from the Bright Angel Shale. This is what that outcrop is there. Um, several new genera. This, again, this is just material that's been recently published. This is Adenosporus. Uh, voluminosus. You can see it's a, a, a series of uh, loosely attached sporophytes, uh, typically uh, thickened, uh, uh, thickened bands or surfaces where you have contact surfaces and also transverse bands, transverse thickenings that occur. These, here's some other examples of what some of these look like. Uh, nope, not particularly sculpted, pretty much smooth walled. Uh, and occurring in different configurations. These are dyad forms. Here's some polyad forms. This is not terribly well preserved material, but it represents the oldest material that we have that's related to these types of, of uh, cryptospores from the Rome formation in the Thornhill section. Uh, here's a second species, uh, Bulatus. It's characterized by these uh, different, uh, these thickened uh, bulbs that occur uh, several uh, per uh, spore body. It, I think these are just a overlap thickening uh, in the wall itself. Most of these are formed by walls that have multiple layers and that layering folds over on itself to give the effect. Sometimes you th it looks like there's some kind of a, an envelope or something that's occurring in this guy. And really, there, it isn't an envelope. It's just that there's a, a wall layer that's there that is, um, is folded over. And we know this because of the work of uh, Willie Taylor, who's done a lot of TEM, uh, done TEM of this, uh, some of these, uh, some of the material. Another genus, uh, new genus, Vidalgia. Here's one, uh, uh, sporus, another new genus. This guy is very spore-like. Uh, sometimes tetras uh, are rather uniform, uh, uniform wall. Uh, <coughs> And so uh, a, a form that looks very much like some of the later uh, uh, Ordovician forms. Uh, here's some work that uh, uh, was published by uh, Li Ming uh, Yin from uh, the, the, the Piaf Shale in uh, Nevada. And that's similar to some things we've also sampled from the Piaf Shale. Sometimes you see these uh, generative cells that appear to have formed in uh, little sheets or attached uh, to each other in some kind of uh, regular arrangement. This is very unlike a real plant or uh, a, a spore that's coming out of a, a, a sporangium. Uh, in the upper Cambrian, this is work that was published in 2009 with Willie Taylor. We showed that so the topology of this Agamachetes form. And uh, our hypothesis then was that the uh, formation of these occurred uh, probably in a, in a manner that uh, uh, similar to the way uh, Coleochaetae uh, forms its uh, zoospores. Here's some new material that was published just recent, recently from uh, Utah, from the uh, upper Dapingian to lower Darwinian uh, material from uh, Fossil Mountain, the Canos Shale. And these, in this case, there are some free standing, uh, sorry, uh, free standing cryptospores uh, here, but the uh, that occur as small tetrads and dyads, but also clusters and clumps. But these very uniform packets of, uh, uh, of cells that fit together, uh, these look, they sort of mimic the morphology of, uh, of Prasciola, a green, a green alga. 
But ultimately, these are spores. They ultimately produce dyads of spores. They're not vegetative units. Here's the uh, new material from the Darwinian, classic tetrads. And th at that point, we're into sort of modern looking stuff. So here's my summary of what that, uh, the difference between the line that's drawn at the middle Ordovician, the Darwinian, and it's kind of where we, you know, most of the sort of textbook level uh, descriptions of this issue say that land plants begin, that is, we really have embryophytic like spores occurring at this line. Uh, here's some of the characters of, these, uh, of the older material and then the qualities of the, of the younger material. I call this specimen, this will change the way you think. What we see in the Cambrian material is a, 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 a disjunction between um, karyokinesis and cytokinesis, as demonstrated here in this diagram. Here's a dyad next to a tetrad inside the spore generating cell. So what's happened is that cytokinesis is occurring later after two phases of, of karyokinesis to produce that particular form. So we can't really use uh, dyads and tetrads, at least as biologically equivalent entities in this. So I refer to this as successive sporogenesis versus simultaneous, essentially modern sporogenesis. Modern meiosis was estab became established probably sometime in the uh, Darwinian. So we can look in terms of overall evolution. This is the last slide with any content. Uh, that we looked our spore evolution in terms of what's happening in the cryptospores where we have free dyads and tetras and endosporic development. We see these spore thalli and tetrahedra tetrads come in in the, you know, in the Darwinian and after this it's very modern looking. I think this is because we're looking at successive sporogenesis here and simultaneous sporogenesis which is modern in the uh, subsequent to that, uh, to the Darwinian. So in conclusion, uh, it, uh, I would say uh, that uh, sub-era spore dispersal to transition from aquatic zoospores uh, occurred uh, during this interval uh, that we were looking at the evolution of multilaminate sporoderm. That evolution is telling us that we're uh, making, the, again, as part of a transitional uh, com uh, component to this story. Uh, the uh, vegetative sporophyte probably co-opted co co uh, a gametophytic bow plants, those, uh, the thalloy, the, the sort of spore thalli we see look very much like certain genera of regular green algae that would be uh, 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 haploid, uh, gametophytic phases. And lastly, that successive sporogenesis, that's this decoupling of karyokinesis and cytokinesis, uh, a, a preceded simultaneous sporogenesis. So the, the, the indication, at least from the spore record, uh, would be that there, there was active origin uh, active uh, evolution or area origin of the sporophytic phase uh, during this time, uh, time period. And just one last uh, 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 comment to uh, two of the co-authors, uh, not co-authors, but of my co-workers, uh, Gordon Wood and Alfred Travis passed away recently this year. Uh, it's kind of sad, Gordon was quite young. He died on Tuesday on my way here. Here he is last year, uh, a wonderful, Man and my uh, thesis undergraduate advisor Al Travis also in September. Thanks very much. <laughs>